Yeah. Here you can hand this out. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's 11 o'clock, so I'm going to go get started. I'm um, going to be talking now about mutual assistance groups, and I've got some cards out there. If you can hand those out, make sure everyone's got one. Because we've got a forum, and a lot of the stuff I'll be talking about actually has PDFs you can print out uh, all the things on here. Um, so first thing is I want to talk about what's the definition of a mutual assistance group. It's a, it's funny, it's, it's a fairly new term in the prepper community and I think they just wanted to get a, a way that they could talk about a tribe that would kind of describe you know, what that was. A mutual assistance group is a group of like-minded individuals who pledge to assist each other in times of crisis. The idea is that many hands make light work. It may or may not be in your best interest to be aligned with one. There are several important things to consider before joining or starting a mutual assistance group. Do I work well with others under austere conditions? What might I have to offer a mutual assistance group by way of specialized skills and equipment? Will I participate regularly with others to build the group before the SHTF? Is everyone in my family on board with teaming up with others? Will I stay with the group or evacuate under different scenarios? If you answered no to the above questions, you may not be ready to join uh, a mutual assistance group. Um, <clears throat> one of the big things uh, that's really important to think about is personal security, PERSEC, operational security, OPSEC, and communication security, COMSEC. Those three things are very important. If you're starting a group, if you have a group, if you're thinking of joining a group, if you come up and you meet a couple guys that have a, a, a group and you know, you're talking about preparedness and this guy's kind of a, a loose friend of yours and he's chatty Cathy, blah, 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 and my friend John's got this and my friend Bob's got that and blah, 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 that may not be a good guy to be aligned with because pretty much he's just told you, you could be, you could be a bad guy for all he knows. And he's just told all kinds of great information about where to go when things get tough, who to see when things get tough. Hey, if I see that guy, he's probably with those friends he was talking about. I'm gonna follow them back home and uh, I'm gonna take all his stuff. I mean, there's bad people in the world. Why do we form a mutual assistance group? Because there's bad people in the world. And you know, when times get tough, it's, it's easier to, if we have to dig a latrine, it's easier to dig a latrine if we've got six people. One can dig a latrine, the others can pull security. If I got to dig a latrine by myself, now I'm digging a latrine and pulling security. So I take a few shovels and I'm looking around, I have a few other shovels. You know, so it's, it's much easier. There's a reason to have a, a group like this. But those security concerns are very important. If you get, see a guy and he talks with you and he constantly is running his mouth on, on Facebook or on Twitter about all the cool stuff he has, he's showing pictures of his arsenal. Well, that's neat, except that now the whole world knows what this guy has. There's no secrets there. Um, and there's some things you just don't want to tell everyone. You don't want to tell everyone you've got a year supply of food because guess whose door they're going to knock on? Hey, let me in. I heard you got a year supply of food. You've been talking about that crap for two years on Facebook. Let me in. Well, you know, so you got to think about that. So those security concerns are very important. They're the number one starting place wherever you're at. And if you're already got a group, you should be looking at, you know, in, you know back at that and going, I wonder if we got that stuff squared away. It's an often overlooked thing. People that are in the, into prepping, they don't think about it. I didn't used to think about it. Nobody ever told me about it. And one day somebody told me and I'm like, well, that makes a lot of sense, <laughs> you know? And so you gotta think, you think Facebook's ability, you think that Facebook's the only ones that have access to your stuff, even if your stuff's private? I can guarantee you that stupid thing's like a, a tool that the NSA invented to get all the information it can. And all your friends are talking about it, talking about you and all this stuff. So. Persec, per OPSEC, and COMSEC, very important when dealing with a, uh, a group. Um, so, and there's another side to this is, I, I meet a lot of people and they say, yeah, I got a group of guys. We're training, we train every week. And then I really dig it down further, I get to know the guy. Their training is getting together for coffee and talking about EMPs and what would they do if, if this happened. Oh, like I heard about, did you see this news story about this biological report? You know, well, I'm sorry, that's not training. That's getting together for coffee and talking about crazy stuff in the world. That's fine, and there's a point for that. But if you're training, if, if that never becomes the genesis for anything else, and you don't actually start to grow a group, and you don't start to train for if that happened, I mean, do you have an emergency plan for your family? Do you have an emergency plan for your team? Do you, do you have a communications plan? What happens if 
it's something crazy like an EMP and we're walking everywhere. I mean, it's not like we can just drive over, pick the other dude up and go. I mean, we're gonna have to meet up somewhere. Do we have a thing where we meet up? Uh, if that's a, a bug out scenario, where are we gonna bug out to? Those things all need to be pre predetermined and they need to be really determined face to face. This isn't something you send by text message and email. Hey man, if things go south, let's meet over behind Kroger. I mean, then if there are bad people in the world, one of those bad people could know where you're gonna meet, you know? Half the computers, there's probably uh, anywhere from 10 to 30% of the computers around are infected with something that is transmitting everything you, you put on there in the form of either key loggers, Trojans, whatever, all the traffic. And that's just the criminal elements of our society. That's not even what the government's watching. So it's just really important that you understand that coffee is not training. Training is training. And when you get talk about it'd be cool to go to the range, is a lot different than going to the range and how cool it is to be at the range. Because there's a difference. So you can, you know, dream about how awesome you would be. If I was, if that happened, I'm going to be Jack Bauer. And that's what I'm going to be. Oh yeah, that's, I hope, hey, that's great. I mean, that'd be neat if that was the case. If I'm Jack Bauer, there's five bad guys. I walk into a room and three seconds later, they're all dead. Well, Jack Bauer, if he was a real person and he really could do that, he would only be able to do that because he trained. He didn't get together talking about how awesome it would be to do that. He actually learned how to do that, if he could do that. Um, and I do believe, I, I have a friend that is a, a, an amazing shooter, like almost artificial intelligence amazing. I mean, it just, he can, I've seen video, you know, a uh, helmet camera video of him doing shoot houses. And he's out of the thing in seconds and every target's hit twice right here. And it's truly remarkable. So there are people that through training can be pretty amazing. But the point being that if you're gonna start a group, getting together for coffee isn't accomplishing anything. You actually have to get out there and do something. And the big complaint I get is, well, we don't have anywhere to train. Don't give me that garbage. Are we, aren't we in the national forest right here? I mean, it's just right there. Did you know that you can carry your guns in the national forest? Conceal carry pistol. Did you know that you can carry a rifle if it's disassembled? Well, the disassembly is not defined. Therefore, you take your bolt out of your rifle and abracadabra, you're not hunting, you're not breaking the law, it's legal. You can carry airsoft in the national forest. Did you know that? You can use the airsoft in the national forest. There's no prohibitions yet to it. That airsoft is specifically defined by the federal government as not an air rifle. Therefore, the air prohibitions against air rifles don't apply. So those are all kinds of excuses people make. And I think it's funny that in, in areas like this, how few people are willing to get together when you've got all this land all around you. We live in Lynchburg and there's spots, but it's tough. You, know, you have to really you have to make a lot of connections and knock on a lot of doors and say, hey, can I get on your property? Another thing a lot of people don't know is in Virginia, you can, sporting activity is, ex you're exempt from being sued for sporting activity on your land. It's, they can't sue you. If it, somebody shoots himself in the foot while they're on your land, too bad for them, you know, it's, you're actually protected. So something to think about, you know, there, there's opportunities out there. One of the things we call it is land stewardship. We recommend people get together <clears throat> with, um, maybe you know a landowner or know somebody that knows landowners, say, look, what kind of land, what kind of issues you have on your land? Some landowners might not want you shooting on there, but they might be fine with you doing a land navigation course or a patrol stuff, or maybe an overnight camp out with, with some of your bug out bag stuff. They might be fine with that. You know, and in exchange, you say, look, I'll put up no trespassing signs. We'll do whatever, you know, help, help you out. And you build relationships like that. You, you can get access to a lot of things. Anybody here know Max Velocity? He's a guy up in, uh, okay, uh, his training is outstanding. He uses a lot of targets like the, I don't know, I saw a pop-up one, yeah. Like that, but more expensive, like crazy, like $2,000 expensive. Um, but there, it's a great uh, setup, but he does live small unit patrol tactics, you can take your whole team up there and he'll train you to react to contact, fight forward, fight back, and it's, it's a really, really good uh, thing. So anyway, he wrote this. There's two themes that are adding up to your death, and he's talking about things he sees at training. Lack of fitness and obesity, too much gear. Fitness, on the fitness side, let's be realistic. When you're doing tactical training, you're doing light infantry training. Let's not forget, 
all that groupy stuff about SOS, FS, elite, or SF, elite forces, and all that. SHTF, it does not matter. You are conducting light infantry operations. If you're intending to do that, you need to be fit enough to shoot, move, and communicate. There's a basic level of gear, and that translates into his weight, that you need to be able to lug about in order to function as a light infantry fighter. You need to be able to move with a load without being too exhausted. The more exhausted you get, the sloppier you will get, the more shortcuts you will take. Keep low moves fast, evolves into an exhausted flop down on your butt, sucking water out of your camelback while failing to pull security. And um, I, I've seen this, I, I've seen it uh, in myself, you know, before I started taking physical training seriously, before, you know, cardio is my big thing I'm trying to solve right now because that's really what he's talking about. He's talking about the ability to keep your heart rate up and keep doing what you're doing, you know, like jumping rope. Imagine jumping rope and then picking up a rifle and shooting it and then jump some more rope and pick a rifle up and shoot it. That's, that's what you're talking about here, what he's talking about from a fitness standpoint. Um, what happened? I clipped some stuff together here. Oh. <laughs> okay. Questions so far? Okay. So you got you got this idea, I want to get together with a group of people. How how do we get started? Well, let's the first thing is um, something that I think is not flexible. And I'm gonna I'll just read this. This is uh, you can actually find this on our website, it's on our forum. Um, if you can't find it, uh, use the card, shoot an email to us. Uh, I'll I'll send you a link to exactly where this is. But you can print this out, it's called Starting a New Minuteman Squad. Um, Step one, five, five men, you could do ladies too, that you can trust. Men of good character that have their heads screwed on straight. These people, these are people you know. Not some guy you bumped into on the street or some guy you see at the gym who's got a cool you know, hat or something. These are people you know. Friends of yours, church members, uh, neighbors, whatever. People that you can trust this guy. I've known this guy, uh, uh, you know, I know how he thinks. We talk all the time, I know this guy. Uh, that you've known for over a year or longer. And no is defined as spending a considerable amount of time with the person, not I, the things I just talked about. This is not flexible. You, you can't deviate from this. Um, as time goes on, you might bring in guys that you don't you know, know, but not when you're starting out. Um, and this is so that you can build the genesis of what your little group is going to be. Whether you call it a militia, a 3% group, a mutual assistance group, you know, Minutemen, you call it whatever you want. You know, this is a group of people that you know, you're gonna, you might be shoulder to shoulder with, you know, shooting at zombies, whatever you want to call it. Um, these are people that you're willing to, you know, fight for and that are gonna fight for you. You have to know this person. The other side is, you bring in some guy that you bumped into at the gym, turns out to be a flake after a year. So now you've been actually training. You've been, you know, he knows, he's been over to your house. He's seen your shelves with your food. He's seen your gun safe. He maybe even knows where you hide the key whatever now you've got it up what do we have what kind of security problem do we have per sec security problem right and as your team goes you have an operational security problem and if this guy's got a big mouth you now have a communication security problem because he told everyone i know these dudes and blah 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 and some people think that this is a backup plan this isn't a backup plan a mutual assistance group minute men uh, your tribe we'll call it that this is plan a you know things go south you know, the first people I call are the guys I trust to go, hey man, you okay? I heard the storm came through, we're fine, we got power, everything's good, you, you cool? You know, yes, no, whatever, you know? And they know, you can show up on my doorstep anytime. You know, the only, only condition is, you have to have food, because <laughs> I can't feed you. Long term, you have to have food. Now, the one exception I make to that is if your house got blown up or burned down or whatever, okay, you know, we'll figure it out, you know, come on in. But, you know, if, if it's laziness, and a lot of people use it as laziness, uh, laziness is the reason they don't prep. Well, you're my backup plan. No, I'm not. If you want me to be your backup plan for guns and ammo, okay, fine. I, you know, I got a few extra of those. I'll, I'll give you one. You know, but but don't. I, I can't feed you because I have other people who are going to who think I'm their backup plan and their family, and I don't have a choice. I feel obligated. I have to let them in. But the other ones, my neighbor, I warned him. <laughs> He knew better. I've been talking to him about this stuff for a long time. He knew better. Don't come knocking on my door. So, so how do we start a squad? Well, you gotta have training. Um, you gotta do something. Maybe it's, uh, 
maybe it's just going to the local range and doing a IDPA or USPSA match. It's a pistol or, or a three gun competition. Or maybe you go shoot skeet, you know, build that rapport, just do something. Um, maybe it's go on camping trips and do wilderness survival stuff. That's kind of what I've started to start to learn about is, you know, how to start fire, how to, how to do those things out in the wilderness. One of the, there's a presenter here. I don't know if he's, pre when he's presenting, but um, he teaches the uh, wilderness survival school. I really want to do some of his stuff. He teaches a seer, seer which is survival and evasion. Um, I really want to take that one. That, that one looks a lot of fun. I just want to talk to him. Is he going to have guys with like barking dogs chasing me? Because that's what I really want that. That'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> but uh, seriously, um, training should be realistic. You should be doing some sort of training. There are, we're really fortunate in Virginia. I don't know if it's our proximity to DC or what, but we have a lot of really good firearms, a lot of good tactical training schools and, and places here. If you're out in the coastal area, there's an actual airsoft place where you can do full on large scale battles. And it's not like these paintball places. I mean, if they have a small city built there, um, there's, there's just stuff everywhere you can go. So you can get your group together or maybe, maybe that's not an option financially. But think about this, you got five people, the class is gonna cost $500 a person. We got five people. Well, you could probably all pay to send the best shooter to the class, and then he could turn around and bring that back to your group and teach everybody what he learned. Um, that's a really effective one. Uh, Max Velocity stuff is great. And so if you've got a guy who can teach, you know, small unit tactics, especially maybe a guy that's ex-military, you know, can bring that stuff in, uh, go do the training, bring it back, and actually go do it in the woods. You can do the, all the stuff Max does without pop-up targets. You can do in the woods, nail a cardboard target to a tree and run the same drill. It just will be there all the time. It won't be moving. <laughs> but um, so you want to start small. <clears throat> I'll talk about uh, building leaders. Um, someone's got to be in charge. Now, typically, historically, uh, militia in militia units, uh, historically in America, Leadership was chosen at the, at the local level, um, and higher leadership was put in charge over those smaller units. So you should choose who you want to be in charge, and it has to be somebody. You can't have five people in charge, in charge of the rudder, they're all gonna be fighting over it. Someone's gotta be in charge. You have to agree and say, all right, we'll follow your, your lead here. You, you, you're gonna be in charge. We wanna say, but you know, you're, you're gonna be the guy. If things start going south, you're the guy, and you should, you know, every, you should just make a commitment that every year you're going to reevaluate that situation and say, let's have an election. Let's choose who's going to be in charge. Um, and your, the guy you choose should be building leaders. He should be training others to lead. That's the, I, my view is that's a leader's job. You should be training your replacement. So the day when you don't want to do it anymore, the day you can't do it anymore, or the day you're dead and we're all going to die. So, you know, someday, someday you're not going to be there to lead. Someone needs to be able to step in and fill that spot. It's real important that you know you you put that in place ahead of time. Um, how many people have been part of uh, a, a church group, church ministry, whatever, that <clears throat> kind of just went away because the guy in charge he he died or, or whatever? Um, and it's sad because it's unnecessary. If if that guy had just had a, a right hand man that he had been training, here's how I do things. Um, he probably could have just kept on going with that. And the same is true a lot of ways. Um, how many are familiar with the Dick Act? It's, uh, it's an act which uh, breaks the militia down into basically the National Guard. Um, in Virginia, I'll break it down in Virginia. National Guard, the Naval Militia. Have we ever had a Naval Militia? I don't even know what that is. Naval Militia, um, the uh, Virginia Defense Force, and the un unorganized uh, militia. Now, National Guard's not the militia because it's the Army. The Naval Militia doesn't exist. The Virginia Defense Force is unarmed. So therefore, historically, can't be the militia. The militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms. It, arms is part of the militia. You know, in Virginia Defense Force, I think that you know they have they're great, but they're unarmed, so it can't be the militia. Then we have the unorganized militia, which is unorganized, therefore can't be the militia because the militia is organized. It's very confusing. But the Dick Act <clears throat> really did a lot of things. Uh, it tried, the intent was to fix the deficiencies in what, what was the militia of the day. And it really didn't achieve that. All it did is add more bureaucracy into it. And now, and they break things. Funny how the government breaks things 
so that they can come along and say we have the solution to what they broke and the solution is the opposite of what you were trying to achieve. Patriot Act, Military Commissions Act, what's the latest one? Affordable Care Act? Is it affordable? I don't, know, I don't think it's affordable. Uh, military, you know, so what's another one? Uh, no Child Left Behind. <laughs> it's kind of like the government always does the opposite of where it says it's going to do. It's funny how that works. But um, so building leaders is critically important if you're if you're building a group, and uh, you can give yourselves, you know, whatever leadership structure you want. You know, alpha male one, alpha male two. It doesn't really matter. You could go with the military structure, which is my preference, just because it's something we understand in our society. So, uh, corporal, sergeant, lieutenant. Um, you know, don't call yourself Major Bob if you get to be the guy in charge. It's just silly. Uh, if you were actually a colonel in the military, you know, I think you should, we should call you colonel because that's just pretty awesome. Most of the colonels I've met are pretty cool dudes, but don't call yourself colonel something if you weren't actually that. Now, if you get a, uh, if you get a thousand man company and some, they all agree that you should be the colonel, well then you can call yourself colonel. But I mean, until then, Come on, be realistic. This is, it's, it's all really silly. But you see this all the time, you know. I'm Colonel so-and-so with the Illinois militia, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what? You're not, you were never a colonel. You know, it would make sense if he was a colonel. But, uh, so, so leadership, leadership structure is really important. Recruiting. So, um, you need to consider this, it's important as training. But, you know, that first year is really important that you, in, in, in general, OPSEC and PERSEC is really important, but that first year is critically important. You, you know, 30% of the people that you bring in, um, you're gonna lose. They're just, they're not gonna hang out. They're not gonna stay. It's not for them. The wife doesn't like the time involved and, and you know, a whole whopping once a month going away for a few hours to train, um, you know, whatever. Um, so what kind of training can you do? Uh, you could do land navigation. You could do bugging out. You could do, um, you know, vehicle convoy. Uh, these are all things you, your small little tribe could be working on. You could do reacting to contact. You could do setting up security. You could do how to dig a latrine. I mean, some of these things are pretty, you know, they sound pretty basic and stupid, but they're important. Um, you know, how to gather water, how to gather food, how to forage. There's lots you can do. If you live in an urban environment, which we don't have too much in Virginia, maybe up, up north, um, your training might be totally different. Your training might be real gray man, you know, behind the scenes, you would wear jeans, you wouldn't wear tactical pants, you would wear, you know, really nondescript stuff that would blend in really well. And you would practice surveillance, you would practice, uh, you know, getting from point A to point B without anyone noticing. Maybe go to a mall with a couple of your friends and have one of them try and spot you guys. I mean, stuff like that. There's lots of things you could do that um, would be good from a training aspect. Um, one of the things that I require if anyone wants to you know come into you know our group is a meet and greet i want to sit down i want to get to know this guy and then there's going to be a limit to there's going to be different things that we do that we're not going to invite new people to you know i want to sit together and have you know have a powwow with with some of the the guys that have been around from the beginning i'm not bringing the new guy that we just met you know because it's a personal security issue and it didn't used to always be this way it wasn't until a few guys just kind of one day just stopped coming and I was like, you know, these, these guys know all kinds of information they shouldn't know. So I started getting really protective of the things that we, we do. So um, one of the things you could do as, as a, a group is an operational exercise. Do a simulation where uh, one of your members has just been involved, a home invasion just happened and he killed the intruders. Okay, what's gonna be the response of your group to that? Because I, I personally think that one of your guys should be over there with your guy when he picks up the phone to call the cops. Because if you're involved in a situation like that, it's totally justified. And let's just assume all legal aspects totally justified. Doesn't mean your DA doesn't want to make a name for himself. I don't call him DAs here, Commonwealth's attorney. You know, um, Doesn't mean he doesn't want to make a name for himself. Doesn't mean that he's your friend. And so you pick up the phone, yeah, that guy broke down my door, you know. How many times we've seen every year there's some guy just total justified shooting and now he's on trial for, for murder. It's ridiculous. So it's real important that you could run an operational exercise where you have one of your guys who's been involved in that and you're, you're basically simulating what you would do if that happened. So that he knows you gotta call, call the guys. Maybe, maybe he's got a lot of you know, guns that he's afraid the cops will take that weren't even related to this event. 
take those, have the other guys take those, you sit there, and basically act as a spiritual counselor, you tell them, call the phone. Somebody just broke into my house, I thought he was gonna kill me. He's dead, click, and now you wait. <laughs> and when the cops get there, you constantly, before the cops come, you say nothing, you say I wanna go to the hospital, I'm in shock, I want a lawyer, you don't tell them anything. Because you're there to protect each other, mutual assistance, you're there to help each other. It's really important that you're looking out for each other. And, you know, I, I'm not anti-law enforcement. I just think that our society has become anti-citizen in a lot of ways, doesn't want us to defend ourselves. And if somebody breaks into your house, man, I don't care if they had a, a, a little tree branch in their hand. They broke into your house. So, you know, whatever. But, so that's one of the things you could do. The other, you know, there's lots of things like that. And all this is on our, on our website. Uh, there are uh, lots of groups out there. Uh, three percenters, who, who's heard of these guys? There's all groups kind of claim that they're the three percent movement. And there really is no, it's kind of like Tea Party. There is no national Tea Party. There's no national three percent movement. There are some guys trying that stuff, trying to charge money or make money off of it or, or whatever, you know. Uh, I'm a capitalist, so I'm not going to totally fault that. But the 3% concept, if you're not familiar with that, is that this society was found, uh, this country was founded by 3% of, of the country. Was 3% were the ones that fought. 3% were the ones that were taking up arms against the crown. So that's where that 3% kind of, you know, name comes from. Um, so... You're going to see, you might see a guy with a hat that has a three on it. He might be a good guy to chat up. He might be interested. If you don't have a group, he might be a good guy to talk to because he might. But again, go slow. It's in a race. We all think it's going to collapse tomorrow, but shoot, I thought it was going to collapse in 2008, and so here we are. And uh, you can't live your life like it's going to fall apart tomorrow. You would go crazy. Um, there is actually a book that a guy has written called um, Building a Mutual Assistance Group. Um, his author's name is, I know the author's name, Randy Kelly and um, William Steger, Stegner. Sorry. Um, lots of blog, uh, audio blogs that are out there with these guys being interviewed. It's actually a pretty decent mutual assistance group. Uh, it's a whole book on it. And it's, uh, oh, $3.95. Can't beat that. So, uh, let's see here. You want to learn lots of different things, right? So what does your, I have a couple of these I could, I can get you. Um, but basically this is areas of, of study, I guess you could call it for your mutual assistance group. Um, and what this does is breaks them down into different levels so that you know what you've achieved. And so you know, you look at this and go, well, all this stuff's done, uh, or maybe like, you know, you got, you're looking at your list and you're like, all these things are pretty good. But you keep doing training on, you know, let's say you keep doing pistol training at the range. Well, everyone's really good with pistol. But we keep skipping the rifle stuff, which, you know, when I first started back in 2008 doing this, I've done uh, lots of pistol training and then uh, started doing rifle training. I never understood until I started doing rifle training why they call it a primary weapon. It is a much better weapon system. If you're in a gunfight, I would much rather have an AR than my pistol. One, I get 30 rounds. Well, 29s, I don't fully load my mags, but, um, and I've got, uh, what, 15 here? So, you understand, understand why that is, and you also, uh, there's a lot of things tactically and as a team that you can do with the rifles that you can't do with pistol. Now there may be instances if you're in an urban environment, a pistol might be a better option, but in most cases, rifle is going to be the primary weapon. So, um, so we look at uh, this list, it's just different classifications. So we know that if everybody's achieved this, we can move on and, and really shoot for this. And each one of these is a qualification. So you move on and move on and move on. As your group grows, let's say it's 20, 30 people. Well, now we know we got a bunch of Deltas, Bravos, Charlies, we don't have any Alphas. Well, let's, let's, let's work on this. Let's do these trainings so we can get some more people that really have a broader range of, of skills, whatever those skills are. And this list doesn't have to be, and it's not, but it doesn't have to be all tactical stuff. It could be, um, you know, you have emergency, you know, IFAC, which is individual first aid kit. Don't raise your hand, but pretend to raise your hand. Who has an IFAC? 
everyone should have an eye. If you carry a gun, it, it's, you should have an eye pack. It should be in your car. If you're out in the woods, it should be on you. This, these things are, it's, it's a first aid kit. I mean, but it's like more trauma based. So you cut yourself real bad. You know, when I was a kid, I don't know if you can see it. A tree root did that right there, a tree root. And I, I mean, I had to go to the hospital, get stitches. They did a horrible job. But you know, as a kid, I guess they didn't care. Um, but a, a tree branch, you could trip and fall and you know, it could puncture an artery. Without a tourniquet, which would be in your IFAC, you're dead. You won't make it back to your car. I don't care if your car's 20 feet from you. you. You puncture an artery, you're dead. Well, the same's true if you get shot. It's your first aid kit. It's not to be used on other people. So stuff like that's on here, you know, uh, where your food, food storage is at. You know, not where it is, but <clears throat> the efficiency of your food storage. Do you have a month's supply of food? Because if you don't, that's a real weakness. You need to know that for your team, you know, and the list doesn't have to be something, you know, it could be, you want to really keep it secure, just go, <clears throat> this is your list. I'll sign off on these things when you get them done. You keep in you keep your list. I don't need to, you know, don't need to be keeping this in a big file folder that somebody breaks in and gets, <laughs> good intel here. This guy's got a, oh wow, he's got a year supply of food and his name is Bob. You know, I mean, you don't, you want to keep that stuff really, really uh, under wraps. But something like this would be really handy for you to help you in your group understand, you know, where do we need to go? What kind of training do we need to do? You should all be adopting things like the same camouflage pattern if you can. It helps, it doesn't have to be multi-cam, although we've used this a lot in the woods. I walked by a guy as close as that stroller and I didn't see him. In fact, I walked by and said, I think there's a guy there. And my brain said, nope, because he was so close and there's no way a guy could, you know, I, I would obviously see him. And we were doing airsoft and then he ended up shooting me, right there. So it's a good camouflage pattern, especially that now that the leaves are back in, you can just, if you don't move, you won't see it. We were up on the AT, um, and uh, I was, we're laying in the, as people were walking by, laying on the side of the trail, and they walked right by, and you didn't see us. So it's a good camouflage pattern. Um, there are lots, of, the only one I don't like is the uh, Digicam. Uh, it's not bad if you were in the desert, but we're not, right? So Digicam's that grayish, that grayish one. Um, but if you could find it, if you had that stuff and it was cheap, it would be really good to use for um, uh, maybe doing a first aid training. You know, that's where you could start. You could start with stuff like that. The goal of a mutual assistance group, in my opinion, is to help the community, ultimately. How are you gonna help the community if you can't help yourselves? So you gotta help yourselves, then you can help your community. You know, otherwise you're relying on FEMA, and you know how that works. I'm not, not a big fan. Uh, mainly because I don't like wasting money. I think it's a waste of money. I think it's our job. It's our job to take care of our community. It's not anyone else's job. And it's your job to take care of your own personal security, not the police's job. So I just don't like wasting money on things that I think it's my job. You know, can I get an exemption? Can I not pay that extra tax? Because I don't use that service. In fact, I'll say, I'll, I'm so confident that I don't use that service that I'll sign off and says, never come to me, never. I will never call you, don't ever come. So, but that's not gonna happen. Um, all right, so I think I've covered all the bases. Any questions? The number one thing is it's not a commune. Communism doesn't work, never has, never will. Um, we, we actually, some of us discussed this idea and it was just like, there's no amount of way that we can work it out where we all chip in and then it goes into a community thing, no. 
you're responsible for yourself. If you want to keep your stuff at my place or me at yours, that's a different story, but it's my stuff. And it's kept at your place, it's my stuff. So the same thing is true. One of the ways, uh, if you can get, if they, if you get the, we want you to carry, you're the backup plan. I get, I, we kind of see that sometimes. <clears throat> Once people realize that you're not gonna tolerate being the backup plan, they usually will be that 30% that don't hang around, they leave. Um, so one of the ways to counter that is to say, look, you, um, you have to feed yourself. That real quickly weeds out a lot of people because they're not willing to do what's necessary to store up food, which is not expensive. Uh, over the long haul, yeah, if I had to go out to Sam's Club and buy a year's supply of food today, sure, that'd be expensive. But over a year's period of time, it's not expensive. Um, and so the, the way to approach people is slowly, you know, again, slowly. You see a guy, you know, out, out and about that maybe is a guy you sort of know, um, say, hey, you know, I, I see your hat, would you like to shoot? Yeah, well, hey, why don't you come on over sometime or let's go, let's go to the range. Hey, you, know, you ever go do the competition shooting? Why don't you, well, let's go, I've been thinking about getting into that. Let's go do that together. Build that relationship, start feeding him things, like opening his eyes to see you know, where he's at. Go, hey, did you see this story, man? Check this out, I printed this out. Stinking government's buying, you know, how many rounds now? We just, oh, they're buying another 62 million rounds of ammo as if they don't have warehouses full of this stuff. You know, and what the heck does Noah need with ammo? I mean, honestly, I mean, are they, what is that? I thought it can't be some Antarctic base. I thought the Air Force ran those, so, you know, whatever. But so approach people slowly, you know, it, it's, if you just jump right into it, yeah, you get the, the hat, the tinfoil hat, and oh yeah, one of these guys, you know. And the media is very successfully, you know, a, a guy wearing this, I wore this to make a point, you know. I don't even wear this out in public, usually. I wore this to make a point for the, for the presentation but this is a oh look one of those guys you know it's the media has done such a job at at portraying people that are prepared as nuts and kooks we used to be the smart ones and now we're we're crazy you know well you know i don't see how crazy we are because we're the ones that survived the storms we're the ones that survived the, the hard times you know i don't know what the big deal is but that's what the media does that's why in the Virginia Ready Reserve, you know, take some cards before uh, you go. We're trying to build a statewide network of prepared people, you know, that that have their own little group doing their own little thing, and but that are helping their community and, and looking out for each other. We don't use the word militia, but effectively in historic terms, that's what we are, because that's what the militia did was help the community, it would protect them from invasion, protect them from, you know, and, and if a storm came, they would come and help. So, but the media has done such a job of, job of demonizing the word that nobody wants to use it anymore. So I'm a three percenter, because I don't want to say, you know, militia. But three percenters are more, you know, even more, uh, the most of the three percenters I know are, are pretty happy with the concept of militia. But they don't want to use the word, same thing. You know, so we could say, like, our, our tactical training that we do, we, uh, we do two FTXs a year where we do a one, a one day and an overnighter and we do stuff every month we're doing training. <clears throat> well, you can come to those, but those are for Minutemen and that's people that have joined the organization and have done a meet and greet with whatever their local group is and says, I want to do this training with you guys and we'll do it. But, you know, that, that, that approaching people, you got to do it slowly because they will. I, I, I've, I've learned that as, as you know, I'm, I'm frequently out there talking to people. And you kind of just have to go, hey man, you know, like we'll do a, a open range day. We have access to some private land and we'll say, you know, bring all your friends that you've wanted to talk to about this and let's just go shoot guns, you know? And then you get the opportunity to, to take a few of those guys and go, hey, what do you think about this? You know, the others, they're happy, ignorant, you know, bread and circuses kind of people. They just want to live their lives and shoot their guns and go back to pretending everything's fine. Hey, cool. Nice having you out. Great. You know, but that you might find one or two out of that that they they got their head screwed on right. Everybody has to start somewhere. You know, I started. I thought well, I take this bag of rice in a burlap sack and I throw it in a bucket, and I close the bucket. And you know, I didn't know any better. A year later, I'm like, I wonder if that's any good. I pulled it out. And I'm like, why does this rice smell like burlap? Because <laughs> I didn't, nobody told me. I had to learn all this stuff from scratch. You know, this is probably before 
prepping was even, you know, 2008, there was no shows, you know, nobody talked about this stuff. The Mormons were the only ones I knew that did preparing. So, any other questions? All right, well, thanks for coming.